In the aftermath of the Great War, it's difficult to separate fact from fiction, history from myth, truth from legend. What is never in doubt is that in the autumn of 2281, a courier accepted a parcel that would change the course of their lives and the entire Mojave forever. This account is just one of the many that follow the courier through their journey. This is Legends of the Mojave. Am I dead? What happened? Someone set me up. But who? Why? What did I do? I'll kill him. I'll make him pay. What did I do? How did this happen? Someone set me up. What did I do? I'll make him pay. What did I do? I'll make him pay. What did I do? The courier's mind was racing as oblivion melted into subconscious and slowly gave way to awareness. He had been shot. Or had he? Could he even trust his own memory? All he knew was that he needed answers, but how could he get them from this place, this void? A voice called out to him. It started out as almost a whisper, drowned out by his thoughts. Then it gained volume and presence. The voice was calm, gentle, but carried with it an unusual authority. Wake up. The courier opened his eyes and his gaze was met by a stranger, someone he had never met, but somehow he knew they could be trusted. Turns out he was in a hospital, or whatever passed for a hospital in those days. The room was dirty, dimly lit, the medical equipment was centuries old and rusted, corroded and otherwise lacking in sterility. The courier had been in rooms like this before. He didn't know when or for what purpose, but he got the impression that it wasn't always his fault. The doc filled him in. He had been shot and buried in a shallow grave. Okay, at least that part had been real. Luckily for the courier, a passing metal fella had seen the altercation, waited until the attackers left, then dug him up and brought him to Doc Mitchell's office. The courier needed more information. He had to know. But the rest of the story would have to wait. His health and very survival demanded it. Together, the doc and the courier spent the morning assessing his condition, physically and psychologically. Throughout the morning, it became apparent that while there was definite memory loss, not everything was gone. The courier knew their name, how to speak fluently, could remember some things from before the incident, so at the very least it was hopeful that he would eventually be able to find his kin, if there were any to be found. The doc offered him the use of anything in the clinic he desired, clothed him, even gave him a working pit boy from his youth as a vault dweller, and gave him a receipt he found in the courier's pocket when he was admitted. The courier thanked him, stepped out into the sunlight, and into legend. The first name on his list of people to talk to was Sunny Smiles, a sort of fixer for the town of Good Springs. She took care of people's problems, but the courier hadn't made it a single step before he saw it, an old H&H &H tool company Securitron slowly rolling down the crumbling streets of Good Springs. That must be the metal fella Doc Mitchell was talking about. The courier sidled up and talked to the robot. The encounter was a memorable one, if uninformative. What vague memories of Securitrons the courier could dig out of his aching skull involved simple, impersonal responses, and each one was indistinguishable from the next, with a generic policeman displayed on an eye-level TV monitor. But this one had a custom image displayed on its screen, a friendly-looking cowboy, and it called itself Victor despite knowing that it was a Robco Security Model 2060B. It spoke as if it was a tired old Brahmin hand, which was somewhat disarming but quickly became apparent that this robot wasn't going to be much help. It claimed not to know much of anything and it had been in Good Springs for years, far too early to have been sent as a premeditated pawn in this twisted game. So for now, the courier gave his thanks, bade his farewell, and continued his mission. Stopping off at the general store, the courier sold off some of the effects he had taken from Doc Mitchell. He felt a little guilty about it, but this was a matter of survival, and he needed every advantage he could get. Depending on how his cards fell, maybe he'd be able to return someday to repay the Doc, but he couldn't get caught up in an internal debate over morality now. This journey started with malice and bloodshed, and the courier couldn't afford to waste time and focus on anything beyond a similar conclusion. With some fresh caps in his pocket, he strolled over to the saloon, expecting to have to pay Sunny Smiles for her help. But the friendly young lady simply marched him out back behind the saloon, handed him a varmint rifle and a fistful of ammo, and started teaching him to shoot like he was her own. She gave him tips and pointers, and though his fine motor skills seemed to be a bit worse for wear, he was shattering sarsaparilla bottles in no time. He tried to hand the rifle back, but Sonny wouldn't have it. She even offered to pay him for helping her on a gecko hunt if he would accompany her. 
How could he say no to such an offer? So the two set off to the town water source. It wasn't the cleanest hunt, but Sonny seemed grateful despite his shaky marksmanship and poor attempts at stealth. The two of them even managed to save a settler who was being attacked by the little beasts. It felt good to be useful, to be appreciated. After all that had happened, it seemed almost alien, but completely natural to lend a helping hand. Before they parted ways, Sonny offered to show the courier how to mix up something called healing powder that the old timers often use out on the trail. With the right know-how and ingredients and a campfire, you can make a substance for just about anything. The only ingredient missing was Xander root, but it didn't grow around the Good Springs water source, so Sunny sent him to the abandoned school since she had seen some growing around that area. Since the root took him right past Victor's shack, he made a quick detour. Something didn't feel quite right about Victor, and it seemed like nobody in Good Springs had a lot of nice things to say about him other than he had never done any of them harm. Victor proved as unhelpful as before, but straight Strangely didn't mind the courier rifling through his shack. A few boxes of ammo, some tech with decent trade value, but no further answers. He wanted more answers. He needed answers. And this robot was hiding something. But Sonny was waiting for that Xander route, so the courier had to move on. So frustrated, he moved on from the robot's shack and headed over to the school. The place was infested with mantises. Manti? What, whatever. Big damn bugs. And since he had heard the school might have decent loot, he ventured in. The place was packed with bugs, but by now he was becoming a decent enough shot that they weren't much of a threat. He rummaged through everything, but other than a safe he couldn't get into, there wasn't much to write home about. He rushed back to Sunny and she taught him how to make healing powder at a campfire. As Sunny left him to head back to the saloon, the courier pondered his first day of this new life. His old one had apparently made him enemies, enough that someone felt he deserved a bullet in a shallow grave. But here he was treated as family, a stranger to whom they owed nothing. The people could handle themselves and took care of one another. There was a quiet future here. He could settle down, make a home for himself. Sunny was a good woman and heck, one day she might even make a fine wife. Did he really need to walk the bloody path he had set forth for himself? The answers to these questions would have to wait as he saw a stranger nearby who, as it turns out, would change the course of his life and the entire Mojave forever. If you're enjoying the story so far, a like on the video would be deeply appreciated. Viewer engagement helps us determine the sort of content that provides the most value to you, a random person on the internet who has the power to determine if I can afford to indulge my sweet tooth with an ice-cold sunset sarsaparilla, or if I have to stick to dirty old tap water. Please, thank you, and now on with our tale. The courier approached the stranger, a prospector and scrounger by the looks of things, pacing back and forth in front of an old camper and looking agitated. Barton Thorne was his name, and his girl was trapped on a ridgetop surrounded by geckos. He had tried to get to her, but he couldn't make it. He pleaded for the courier's help, but this was a dangerous task. The courier had just been on one successful gecko hunt that day, and he felt confident that he could clear a path for Barton's woman to make it back to safety. He stalked his way up the hill, cautious, silent, deadly. Gecko after gecko fell, but still no sign of Barton's girl. Finally, the courier reached the ridgetop, a small overlook strewn with corpses and surrounded by bear traps. There was some minor loot stored in ammo boxes and an old refrigerator, but nothing overly valuable. It wasn't much, but it would be decent enough payment for trying to reach Barton's girl. The realization struck just as Barton appeared behind him. People have killed for a lot less in this world. Barton hoped to count himself among that desperate and despicable few, but underestimated the courier. A fatal mistake. Had he really been so clueless that he walked right into a trap to save some damsel in distress? Stay in Good Springs? Settle down? Enjoy fellowship? Start a family? Had the courier really been so naive? The Mojave is a harsh place. Sooner or later, violence will find you. Neighbors helping each other is all well and good, but unconditional trust will kill you quicker than a half-starved Deathclaw. No, the folks in Good Springs were good people and they had done right by him, but there was a reason he awoke that morning with a hole in his skull. Barton chose a path of deceit and violence and reaped his just reward. The man who put a bullet in the courier's head deserved no less. The courier knew very little about who he was, where he was going, or what he would find at the end of his journey. But for now, justice was as good of a motivator as any. Besides, the dandy in the smoking jacket probably wasn't the type to leave a lot of loose ends, and all it would take would be for him to learn that the courier survived for him to come back to this peaceful little town and bring all sorts of unpleasantness to people who didn't deserve it. 
There was no need to ruminate any further on this topic. He had made up his mind on the matter. But the people of Good Springs deserved better than a looted clinic and a general store that had traded its ammo stock for Doc Mitchell's personal library. He decided to take the long way around to Good Springs by walking the old roadways. As he walked, he strategized, hoping to find a way to repay them. On the way, he spotted a cave entrance guarded by a pack of coyotes. Carefully and methodically, he laid waste to the pack and discovered grisly evidence within the cave that the canines had been preying on folk for some time. There was some decent loot in the cave and the town was safer for now. A win-win. The courier visited a few more nearby locations, some infested with coyotes or insects, others oddly abandoned. By the time he cleared bloatflies and a bark scorpion out of the Good Springs graveyard, the very same from which he had recently been disinterred, it was clear that no more epiphanies would come from this place, and no amount of this do-gooder nonsense would seem to ease his aching conscience. Or was that his head wound? Yeah, it was time to get this show on the road. He stopped by the saloon on his way out of town to introduce himself to the proprietress, Trudy, but he arrived to find her arguing with a man wearing some sort of uniform. He didn't look or behave like a man who derived much authority from a position that would require a uniform, so the courier decided to wait until he stormed off before approaching Trudy to make his introductions. He steered clear of asking about the man who had just left, and instead asked the same questions he had grown quite tired of asking. Did you see the men who shot me? Do you know who they are? Do you know where they were going? The general consensus from asking pretty much everyone in town was that they were heading to New Vegas, but the road to Vegas along I-15 was a no-go for some reason. Better to head south, the opposite direction from where he wanted to go. As a gesture of goodwill, the courier fixed the radio Trudy kept behind the bar, accepted a few caps as payment, and trudged outside. The Mojave stretched before him, and he still had more questions than answers. He found himself struggling with the idea of morality. The argument between Trudy and Joe Cobb was none of his business. It didn't concern him. He had taken advantage of some folk, but those same folk willingly gave him anything he asked for, and in the end, he had put a significant dent in the geckos, bloatflies, and coyotes, making it safer for settlers to make it to the water supply outside town or pay their respects to the folk still lying in the Good Springs Cemetery. He even dealt with that piece of trash sending people to their deaths up on that ridge top. He didn't want to cause hardship for anyone, but he certainly wasn't some messiah here to solve all of Good Springs' problems for them. For now, he had done enough. He looked back at the town, slung his rifle over his shoulder, and set off toward the Long 15. The courier didn't know it at the time, but these were the first steps of an epic journey folks still continue to discuss and debate to this day.